Our first session this morning uh, brings uh, Craig Neal, who's the, is this on? Yeah, it is. Uh, District Director of the Atlanta Nashville District Office for the Office of Labor Management Standards of the U.S. Labor Department. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he serves uh, in this capacity uh, uh, overseeing the geographic distribution of Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Alabama. Uh, prior to being uh, director of this district for the OLMS, uh, Craig served as an investigator with this agency in Washington, D.C.'s uh, district office and in the Phoenix office as uh, Phoenix remote work site. Uh, he served as a senior investigator of OLMS in the Nashville district office and has served as district uh, director since August 2006. He's a veteran of the U.S. Air Force and he uh, has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master in so master's in sociology from my university, Middle Tennessee State University, where he worked with me. Um, and I well remember the, the day you were in an undergraduate introduction class uh, to sociology, I think. And I uh, started running uh, data on the board and showing students, much as you had a little workshop here this morning with Steve Rondown, how to uh, how to ask questions with numbers, and he said, that's cool, <laughs> and, so, and, and uh, his life went astray. So, uh, we're, every couple of years, we like to have uh, someone from the Office of Labor Management Standards come uh, to our uh, conference because it's another of those quiet federal agencies that's so essential to our uh, to our, our lives uh, in employment and labor relations, but really to the, uh, the functioning of the economy as a whole. And so I'll get out of Craig's way, and he has a lot to say that's more interesting than what I have to say. So. All right. Thank you, Bill. All righty. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Right. I normally speak loud anyway, so I normally can get by without one. If anybody has trouble hearing in their your presentation, just let me know, and uh, I'll be happy to use it. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, as Bill said, I, uh, I'm a graduate of the uh, sociology, a Master's of Sociology from MTSU. Bill was my graduate advisor throughout my graduate program. Um, and I've worked with Tara for many years. Unfortunately, the last several, I've just been so busy with everything that's going on with OMS, I haven't been able to make it. Um, but I'm very happy to be here today. Um, it's been a few years since I've been able to make it down. And uh, this is a great organization, and I've been a member since forever. <laughs> so, um, graduate school. I started, started out as a graduate um, student. So, I'm a district director of the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Labor Management Standards. How many of you have heard of us? If, you work, if you're with a union, I know you've heard of us, that annual financial report they get to file, that's us. Um, we're a very small agency, and we're going to kind of walk through some of what we do today and some of the, the uh, regulatory work that we do. The U.S. Department of Labor, um, uh, Office of Labor Management Standards, basically the Secretary of Labor has the authority over all agencies within the Department of Labor, so that is our boss. Um, the Office of Labor Management Standards is one of the agencies, or one of the smaller agencies in the U.S. Department of Labor. And uh, it's under the director, uh, direction of a director, our director is Michael Hayes. Um, Michael uh, will actually be in town today. I'm going back to Nashville after this presentation to meet him. He's coming in for the day, uh, which doesn't happen often. He's only sits up in D.C. Where, uh, where his offices are, but uh, we're lucky to, to host him here today. OMS has four regional offices and 12 district offices throughout the U.S. Um, prior to August 2013, we had 20 district offices through the reorg, government trying to downsize. We've downsized to 12 district offices. We have the northeastern region, the southern region. Southern region is the one that concerns me the most since I'm part of the southern region. I, I am the district director for the, for the Atlanta National District Office. We have the Dallas New Orleans office and the Washington office, Washington, D.C. Our names look weird, Boston, Bo uh, Boston, Buffalo, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, it's a pattern you'll see throughout when you're talking about our district offices. When we merged um, offices last October to try to downsize, the naming convention we came up with is just take the two former district offices and put their names together. 
So Atlanta had a district office, Nashville had one. We merged with think Atlanta and Nashville. Um, we have the central region and the western region. We also have resident offices. That's where we have one or two or three investigators working um, in a city somewhere, Birmingham, Fort Lauderdale, Honolulu, Kansas City, Mrs. Uh, Minneapolis, Phoenix, and Tampa. Um, our district office has the largest number of resident offices. I have one in, in uh, Birmingham, one in Fort Lauderdale, one in um, Tampa, and then another work site in Charlotte, North Carolina, plus the Atlanta and National Office. So basically, one of the things that I, I will repeatedly come back to is that our website, www.olms.dol.gov. You can also find us through the main DOL webpage, www.dol.gov, and search under agencies for OLMS. The reason that's important, one of the Secretary's uh, Labor's initiatives is to you know, go green as possible. One of the ways we do that is by cutting down on paper. Um, normally when I would have come to a presentation like this, I would have brought a box of pamphlets to pass out and try to get you, you know, excited about all of this. We're trying not to do that anymore. We're trying to now say, you know, let's go to the website. Most of us have access to technology. Let's go there and look up everything that we have, including this presentation, is on, is on our website. A version of this presentation. I changed it. It hasn't been updated, but I updated it for our, our new alignment with the combining of our district offices. So basically, what do we do? Uh, we administer most provisions of the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. That is one act. It was written in 1959, passed by Congress. And basically, that act um, governs um, union democracy and financial reporting, um, and has some criminal provisions concerning labor unions. It also affects, affects employers, um, and that's not one of the things we talk about a lot. But employers also have certain reporting requirements, or consultants have certain, certain reporting requirements under the Labor Management Reporting Disclosure Act. And I talk about it, I'm going to call it the LMRDA. That's basically how we refer to it. But the LMRDA, we're going to kind of go through each of the sections and, and hit the highlights of, of what we do and what it says. We also administer provisions of the Civil Service Reform Act the Government Accountability Act, the Foreign Services Act relating to standards of conduct for federal employee unions. So the LMRDA is the union that governs um, the, the types of activities that private sector employee unions have to adhere to. Civil service, federal sector employees, they're go governed under our provisions of the CSRA um, that relate to the uh, LMRDA. We perform four basic functions. Um, public disclosure of reports, compliance audits, investigations, both civil and criminal, and education and compliance assistance. We're gonna go through each of these, um, but with the public disclosure of reports, all of our reports are online. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want to see, um, and we'll go through the reports in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but, Basically, if you want to see um, how a labor organization is doing financially, where their money is being spent, the members want to see that, this law ensures that those reports are posted online, or not, doesn't ensure they're posted online, ensure that they're available for public disclosure. We have chosen to post those online so that anybody can have access to this information. So our public disclosure activities Unions must annually file a, a financial report with OMS. It's called an LM2, LM3, or LM4. Uh, a labor organization annual report from LM2, 3, or 4. Uh, we'll discuss those here in a minute. Um, it also ensures that employers, labor relations, consultants, union officers, and employees, also surety companies, um, insurance companies, are also required to file certain reports under certain circumstances, and we'll kind of go through those here in a little bit and get the highlights. Um, most reports available online and can be accessed through our website, www.unionreports.gov. You can also find it through our main web page, okay? For compliance assistance activities, we do a, we do a couple different things. We conduct audits of labor organizations to determine if they're complying with the federal law. Basically, what we want to see is that the monies are being used in support of the membership. Um, 
The compliance audit program is a streamlined audit designed to account for union funds and to verify LMRDA compliance. Um, it's, it's, it's a very simple audit to do. You have to, excuse me, this change in weather has a, got my throat scratching. So um, basically, with the CAP program, 10 step audit, we normally conduct it within seven to 10 days in a labor organization. Go, we try to go on site and do it as many as we can. Just to verify that, that the union is using its, its funds for the benefit of its members. ICAP is a companion program. The ICAP program, we just say it's in scrap. We, don't, we no longer have an ICAP program. So this, this is where the slide is just a little outdated. Um, ICAP is basically an international compliance audit program. We no longer have that, that program anymore. Um, so CAPs or compliance audits allow us to um, offer compliance assistance to union officials um, to say, you know, basically, uh, let's say, you know, you go out and purchase some equipment. What is the documentation required to be kept to show that, that the use of funds was actually for that piece of equipment? Um, if we go out to and have a conference, what documentation do we need to provide to the union or the union officials need to provide to get back to the union? So we do it for compliance assistance um, reasons. Um, we also do it to help them uh, detect problems within the organization um, and prevent future violations of the act. And we're going to go through a little bit more of the, the financial record keeping requirements of the act here in a, a little bit. The types of investigations, I said we conduct civil and criminal investigations. We have a two tier track, we have investigators that work for us. Our investigators are either civil investigators or criminal investigators, um, and they tend to stick to or work the track that they're assigned. Um, so, our investigations have several things that we're looking to, or that several types of investigations we conduct. We conduct um, under the Act it's a requirement that members who are subject to a collective bargaining agreement um, have access to that uh, copy of that collective bargaining agreement. So, we make sure that. If a member has been denied access to their CBA, we can conduct an investigation and ensure that they get that because the law requires that in certain circumstances they have access to that. We also have reporting requirements, investigations that we, you know, delinquency and deficiency investigations when we have an, uh, um, an LM2, 3, or 4 report that has not been timely filed. The law requires that it be filed within 90 days after the end of the union's fiscal year. Um, so if within 90 days it has not been filed with, with our organization, then we may open a, de a, delinquency, or de a delinquency investigation where we, uh, one of our investigators seeks to obtain that report from the union. Um, and then if the report comes back and we're not you know, happy with it, there, there seems to be a lot of errors on it, um, then we may open a deficiency program where we go out and ask the union to correct that report. And just, you know, make sure that we're getting good information back to the membership, because that's basically what these forms are for is to make sure that the membership have access to what's going on financially within my union. We conduct trusteeship investigations. Um, the law requires that um, if a, a parent body or, or a uh, other organization imposes a trusteeship over a local or some other subordinate body, there are certain reasons, only, there are only certain reasons that trusteeship can be imposed. So one of the reasons has to be one of the reasons could be you know, financial problems within that union. And the parent body said, I need to go in and correct these. Okay, that's a valid financial reason under the Act. Um, but uh, you know, an invalid reason would be, well, we just don't like the current elected officers, so we're going to get them out. Well, that's not enough of a reason to go in and subject that union to trusteeship. So if we get trusteeship complaints, we'll investigate those and yeah. look into those. Um, we conduct an election of officers. Election of officers and embezzlement of union funds are our two biggest program areas. Um, elections of officers, basically the law lays out the standards that a local, intermediate, or international or national union have to follow to hold a valid election of officers. If they violate that or, or potentially violate it, uh, a member, um, the law requires that a member first attempt to exhaust internally and get the union to voluntarily um, you know, look into that issue and see if there's a way to correct that election if there was a problem, or to say remember there was a problem. And then the law gives the, and we'll talk about this more, the law gives, uh, LMRDA gives the member certain rights to come to us at certain, during certain time periods, 
And we will look to see if there were violations of the act, and if there were, we will seek to, to remedy those through voluntary compliance uh, with the union, which is always our first step, where we sit down with the union and negotiate an agreement to run, rerun the election and, you know, settle this, and that's what we do. Um, if, there's, if there are violations and there's no voluntary compliance, then the secretary will seek to file suit in federal district court to compel the union to overturn that election and allow us to, to rerun. Embezzlement of union funds. Um, this is what our criminal investigators, the criminal investigators primarily do. Um, if a union officer or employee embezzles money from the union, it's a federal crime. This is the law that, or this LMRDA is the act that imposes that. So basically, um, if we get allegations or we conduct an audit and see problems and, and feel like there are, if there is criminal activity, there is embezzlement of funds, we'll go in and conduct a criminal investigation and seek to have that person prosecuted through the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, Department of Justice. Bonding investigations, um, making of loans, payments, or fines. We have prohibition against certain persons holding office. Uh, it's our, our 504 bar, 504 being the section of the act that talks about, about this. Basically, it says that any labor union official or any labor union officer um, cannot have been convicted of a borrowable offense. Those would be things like theft, embezzlement. Um, and so if there is a, a conviction of something of that nature within the past 13 years, then that person's not eligible to hold office in a labor union. Um, and so we when get allegations of those types of uh, violations of the act. We go in and investigate to determine is that person vulnerable under the act? And if they are, we seek to remove them from office. And all of this is meant to protect the union members' money. So they don't want to pay into it. The union members' rights because of their labor organization. Deprivations of rights um, under act by violence. Um, we don't do a lot of these cases, but we do see, you know, when we do get these cases, they're pretty interesting. Um, basically what it is, is uh, if a labor union officer or official, um, you know, physically threatens violence and deprives the right of a member, um, then that could be a federal crime, you know, and, and typically these involve something as simple as a uh, conflict between two individuals within the union, one of whom is a position of power, and they abuse that power by threatening to, you know, I will beat you up if you vote on this, or that is a federal crime. So we investigate those type of uh, allegations also. And then extortionate picketing, which we just don't see that much um, down here in the South. We also do education and compliance assistance that we're doing today. We try to do, um, in my district, we try to do a compliance assistance session in, in pretty much every state that I have jurisdiction over. So we do one in Tennessee, we do one in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina. We skip South Carolina because it's so close to North Carolina, so South Carolina and maybe go to Georgia or Florida or uh, North Carolina. We do those once a year. We advertise those by sending out um, letters um, to every labor organization within our jurisdiction, seeking to invite them to the conference, the free conference. Um, we typically try to have the conference at a union hall so that it's you know, no cost to, to anybody involved. Um, and then it's a, a chance for labor union officers or officials to learn more about the act. And we cover a variety of, of different topics in those activities. Everything from how to conduct a union officer election to um, how to, you know, be financially, um, physically responsible to the membership. Um, we talk about how to fill out the LM reports. Um, they're wonderful sessions to attend, so we try to do them once a year. Um, we'll be getting that information out probably in the next month, month and a half, and we'll give a year schedule. So <clears throat> we also open it up to the public. I mean, if we have, I know there are several students here today. If you all want to come, talk to Bill, and Bill can always get that information from me. We also post it on our website, um, so it's also available through our calendar on our uh, OMS website. We also do a, a, a number of smaller targeted um, compliance assistance activities during the year, like I'm doing today, where we go to certain groups. We've been invited um, 
you know, every year we get invited by different groups. Then we've done work with the steel workers. Where we've gone to the conference they've had in Nashville. We've I've gone to the with the um, American Federation of Government Employees and done a presentation for their business agents or stewards or whoever they bring in for whatever purpose, and, and do a presentation on the act and can target the presentations to whatever's you know um, whatever is uh, interesting for that group. Sometimes it a group of financial secretaries for a union, they always want to know more about the financial working keeping requirements. So we'll discuss that in a greater detail. So if you ever have a need or want um, some training in some of these areas, feel free to contact me. My business card is up here on the podium. I'm going to leave it here today. Unfortunately, like I said, I have to leave today after, but I'll be back tomorrow with tomorrow's presentations just because I want to um, be able to sit in and listen to them. Um, but if you have, you know, take a business card, if you want us to come out and, and do a training with one of your groups, let us know. We'd be happy to. So like I said, our, our trainings, compliance assistance, can range from one-on-one -on -one meetings where the ALA union official call and say, I'm having trouble filling out this report, can I come into your office and sit down with you? We're more than happy to do that. To seminars with hundreds of union officials. Um, we also um, tailor the trainings to meet the needs of union members, employers, consultants, and general public. Um, not as much with employers and consultants, but uh, we do have requests periodically to do that. So we publish and distribute um, pamphlets that uh, emphasize voluntary compliance with that act. That's what we're always seeking to, to, to work with and negotiate with the union is voluntary compliance. Um, and all of that information is on our website. Um, we don't print them as much as we used to. We now tend to print them off quickly if we need them. Um, the, we also conduct seminars and workshops about the law in general and about specific areas such as election uh, procedures, completing the reports. As I said, just contact me if you want something scheduled. We work with international union officials to correct and prevent violations of the act. Um, our director and our press director too, under um, just like last year, are really good at reaching out to internationals um, in areas around them and going out and doing one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions with the international officials, not only about the international, but about subordinate organizations, subordinate unions, and what we as OMS can do to help those organizations. Um, so we've, we, in the last several years, uh, developed close relationships with internationals at our national level in DC. We participate in a variety of union conventions, um, providing displays and publications, giving speeches, doing panel discussions, and conducting workshops for persons that are attending. Um, and we also do, um, we, we teach, a, uh, and one of my favorite programs for us to teach is a basic audit call it a 10-step audit. Um, it's not quite like our audit program. It's much more simplified. But it is, uh, we'll go out and teach uh, a group of trustees or financial secretaries or you know, um, an audit committee in the union. Sit down with them and teach them over the course of a day how to conduct a very basic audit of their union records. And what then, you know, to help um, see if there are any problems, to help correct any problems, so we don't even have to get involved. I love that program. It's one of the, the best training tools that we have for, for unions, especially smaller unions, because we can really get out there and teach the membership how to govern their union themselves, which is basically what the law wants us to do. So the LMRDA was enacted by Congress to ensure basic standards of democracy and fiscal responsibility in labor organizations representing employees in private industries. That's the LMRDA. Um, OMS and OLS, OMS enforcement of the LMRDA is partly uh, important because it, it fosters union democracy, financial integrity, and transparency. Those are the three goals that, that you will see all over our publications. Union democracy, <coughs> financial integrity, and transparency. Those are what we are looking for within labor unions. The act was, in, was enacted due to um, numerous uh, problems in labor unions back in the you know, 40s and 50s. And Congress responded by passing this act. Um, you know, I always um, kind of get tickled, I guess that's the way to say it, when I meet a group of new 
you know, walk into a union hall and meet a group of new labor union officials, and they, you know, want to treat like I'm a bad guy. And, and I'm not anti-union. I'm not pro-union. I'm pro the act. But I'm pro also working with the union to make sure it operates within that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not there to antagonize the union. It's never been our role. Um, we're basically there to, to work with the union just to make sure that it complies with the provisions of the LMRDA. So the Act um, grants certain rights to union members and protects their interests by promoting democratic procedures within the union, within the labor organization. The principles of the LMRDA are a strong and honest and responsible trade union movement, control of internal affairs and finances by fully informed rank and file members, union members, and fiduciary obligations of the union officers. So, I mean, those are the principles we're looking to adhere to. Who's covered? Unions representing employees of private sector employer, employers are covered by the Act. Unions rep representing U.S. Postal Service employees are covered by the LMRDA as a, as a result of the Postal Reorganization Act. And unions representing federal employees are covered by the um, implementing regulations of the standards of conduct provisions of the Civil Service Reform Act which is the law that governs civil service employment. So we, we have jurisdiction over postal unions, federal sector unions, private sector unions. We don't have jurisdiction over municipal, state, or local unions, local employer unions that are not affiliated with a private sector employer, federal employer, postal employer. So municipal type of unions, um, that work strictly for, let's say, all the employers, employees are sanitation workers in the city, and they work for the city, we don't have jurisdiction over them. So we get a lot of those calls. Unfortunately, the act didn't grant us that. It's the state's right versus federal rights. We want to keep the states, let them have control of their unions. <clears throat> As I said, local unions representing only state, county, and municipal employees are not covered by the act. So the LMRDA has five titles, six titles. Title I um, contains a Bill of Rights for Union members. Title I rights, we're going to walk through these in a moment, little by little, so I won't take too much right now. Title II Act contains reporting requirements for labor organizations, employers, officers, labor relations consultants, and surety companies. Surety companies being the, um, the insurance company that is bonding the union officials within, or the union um, to make sure that if there is a loss, the bonding company will pay off on that. Title III governs trusteeships imposed by parent bodies over subordinate organizations. Title IV provides the minimum requirements for, for conducting fair and democratic regular election of officers. The law requires local, election, local unions hold elections every three years, intermediate unions every four years, and the national and national unions every five years. Title V contains safeguards for protecting labor organization funds and assets. That's basically where our criminal provisions are found. That's also our compliance audit authority to have us to give us access to the union records so that we conduct a compliance audit. And Title VI contains miscellaneous provisions including extortionate picketing and deprivations of rights by violence. Title I, the Bill of Rights. Um, union members have equal rights to nominate candidates for the office or for office, to vote in union elections, to participate in union meetings, and to meet with other members and express any of their opinions. They can have you know, whatever opinion they want. They have the right to speak with their, their labor organization. Unions may impose assessments and raise dues only by democratic procedures. So a union can't just decide, well, we're going to raise dues today and then impose a, a raising of those dues. There has to be some type of democratic procedures in there to, to allow the membership to vote on that, to have the membership some voice in what am I going to pay to support my union. Unions must afford members a full and fair hearing of charges against them. Unions must inform their members about provisions of the LMRDA. So, at our compliance assistance activities that we do with unions. We try to hand out a, just a little fact sheet that tells what, you know, summarizes what the OMS does and how it applies to the members. And we ask that unions post that at their work, at their, um, uh, work sites or union halls. 
Union members and non-union employees covered by collective bargaining agreements have rights to receive or to inspect those agreements. Um, so with the reporting requirement, Title II, unions are required to file information reports, copies of their constitution and bylaws, and annual financial reports with OMS. Uh, the information report is called an LM1. It's filed at the beginning of the unions or with the 90 days after the union forms. And they just basically lay out the information report, who they are, what their purpose is, what's their governing documents, things like that. that those reports are, are can be accessed through the membership online. They also uh, complete an annual financial report with OLMS. And then constitution bylaws are filed with our office and we have those cataloged and are still in the process of, of getting those online for the members. To, to be able to search to see their governing documents. So the LM1 must be filed within 90 days after becoming subject to that, after formation, as soon as the union gets recognized. And actually, it's not even recognized, because what the act actually says is if a union is subject to the act if, they, if the union is actively seeking to represent members. They don't actually have to have the right to represent those members. So if the union is seeking to represent members, then they could be possibly subject to the act. So the annual financial report, is basically the way I try to explain this, it's like our tax forms that we as individuals file with the IRS every year. Well, this is just one for the union. Um, it, it, the LM2 must be filed by unions with annual receipts of $250,000 or more, that means $250,000 or more of money coming into the union. Um, the LM2 report is filed strictly online. We don't have a paper form anymore. Um, we, uh, so if that's to be filed, the um, best way to get information on that is go to our website and read the section on the LM2. There's a, you know, a whole series of steps that union officials have to take to, um, to get access to the, the software to file the report. Um, and then for LM3 reports, the unions with annual receipts of $10,000 or more, but less than $250,000, so these are your mid-range unions. Um, and then LM4 are small unions, annual, annual receipts are money coming in under $10,000. Um, forms LM2, 3, and 4 must be filed within 90 days after the end of the union fiscal year. Majority of that time is December, is the end of the fiscal year, but we have different dates, depending on the union. At any point, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I will open it up. Yes, sir. On those three levels of unions, what, uh, what, just off the top of your head, would be the sort of percentage distribution in your district? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what percentage are the highest level, the next, and the smallest that are getting that? Okay. I would say the largest number of unions that we have in the Atlanta National District Office are LM3 filers. So that's between $10,000 and $250,000 of annual receipts. Um, um, I think that, that distribution, so, so that's the largest majority, I would say probably 85% of our unions are LM3 filers. Um, the reason for that is we live in the South, so we don't have strong history of collective bargaining um, and don't have some of the same rights that more, you know, northern states have where there is a longer history of collective bargaining. bargaining. Um, geographic distribution on the Upper East Coast is going to be more LM2 and large LM3 filers. Down here, it's going to be more LM3. And we have uh, LM3 and LM4 filers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Um, the Form LM30 report, this is strictly for union officers, employees that engage in certain type of reportable activities that are all kind of summarized in the act. Um, so, any officer or employee must report any loan or benefit received from or certain financial arrangements with um, employers whose employees their union represents and employers or businesses that deal with their union. So if a union, a quick easy example, if a union officer, and it says union officer, the union officer requirements, union officers and their family and their spouse or, or children that they still live in their home. Um, if a union officer, um, Local union officer, his wife engages in a, or has a catering business. He asks her to come and perform all of the catering for the union. 
That's a reportable activity for that union officer. It's basically to, to give transparency to you know, where is our money going and what is it being used for. Um, and if it's going to his spouse or his, his you know, dependent child, then we want to know that. We want the members to know that. Um, same thing for an employer. If an employer engages in certain type of activity, let's say um, they hire a labor union official to do work for them, but it's not part of the employment contract, not bona fide, not part of their bona fide employment with that employer, but some other type of separate employment, you know, then we want to know that too. Because that labor union official, in our view, should be representing their membership. And these type of, of um, arrangements may be perfectly legitimate, but we think that the membership at least didn't need to know about them. So I'm not going to go too deep, deep into that, but that all of the information is on the website. We do special training for these type of reports. Um, union officer and employee reports for the Form LM30 must be filed within 90 days after the close of the fiscal year of the person completing the report. An LM10 report, employers who make certain payments to union officers and employers must pay a LM10. So this would be the employer side would be filing the support. LM30 is labor union officer would be filing. Employers who hire labor relations consultants to gain, engage in certain activities to persuade employees about their rights to organize and bargain collectively or to supply information to the employer in connection with a labor dispute must file an LM10 also. Much more information on our website about Form LM30 and LM10 reports. Once again, they must be filed within 90 days after the close of the employer's fiscal year, must be signed, uh, signed by the president and treasurer or some corresponding principal officers of the um, employer. Form LM20 reports are basically agreement activities reports. They, they um, must be filed with a, per, a person pursuant to an agreement with an employer. So if this is a consultant type of report that has to be filed, if a consultant um, engages in work for an employer that meets certain of these under, they to undertake activities to persuade employees as to the manner of exercising their right to organize and bargain collectively. Um, they supply certain types of information to an employer in connection with a labor dispute. Um, then the, the uh, consultant must file an LM20 report to you know, make that type of reason transparent to the general public, to the membership. The LM20 report must be filed within 30 days after entering into such an arrangement or agreement. The person responsible for signing the report are the president and treasurer or corresponding principal officers or self-employed or, or if self-employed, the individual performing the activities. And each individual required to sign the report is personally responsible for the filing and for any statement contained therein which he or she knows to be false. Now, with these forms, um, you know, there is a section of the act that says if you file a form that contains false information and know it's false, then you're subject to criminal provisions of the act. So our investigators also um, investigate those type of activities. 21 is just basically, it, it goes hand in hand with 20, it's just basically the financial information um, concerning <coughs> that arrangement that you report. So you report the arrangement, 21, you basically report the finances of that arrangement. All our reports and documents filed with OMS are public information. Um, now, are subject for, to public information. Union uh, annual financial reports, employer consultant reports, union officer employee reports, um, all of those that are filed since 2000, the year 2000, are available for review and are printing from the OMS website. Um, anything filed before 2000 is available to the public disclosure by contacting the district office or our national office. And we'll send out a hard copy of that for you. Our address at our national office So reporting requirements, um, the reporting requirements, Title II requires that filers keep records necessary to verify the accuracy of the information contained in the reports for a period of five years from the date of filing the report. 
Unions must uh, make information contained in its report available to its members, and if members can show just cause, permit him or her to examine the supporting documentation. Okay, so if a member can show just cause from examining that report, then they have a right to then inspect those records. We also conduct investigations to ensure that there's not been a violation of that. So if a member comes to us and says, I, I tried to show just cause, and my union wouldn't let me you know, review the records, and we'll come in and, and require or compel the union to do that. Trusteeships, Title III. Trusteeship is any receivership, trusteeship, or other method of supervision or control whereby a parent organization or, or suspends the autonomy of an otherwise subord uh, available to a subordinate body under its constitution by license. So, um, they only may be imposed for the purposes specified in the Act, and they must be established and administered in accordance with the Constitution and bylaws of the labor organization um, that imposed it. Trusteeships may be established for the following purposes. Correcting corruption or financial malpractice, assuring the performance of collecting bargaining agreements, restoring democratic procedures, or otherwise carrying out the legitimate objects of the union. Kind of a vague statement, but um, that's what it says. If a parent body uh, imposes a subordinate labor organization to a trusteeship, they must file an initial uh, LM report, uh, LM 15, a semi-annual and a terminal trusteeship report. So those are the form LM 15 are the trusteeship reports, and then the form LM 2, they have to file an LM 2 as long as that union is in trusteeship for that union. So when it, the uh, annual financial report is required, they have to file the LM 2. They have to file a 15A if they select delegates or officers to vote at a convention, and then the term, terminal trusteeship report that form LM16 and a form LM2 saying the trusteeship is no longer imposed. If a trusteeship is imposed, a parent body may not engage in certain activities. They may not transfer funds to the parent except for normal payments like per capita tax. So they can't take the money from the union and use it for their own purposes still that local union's member, local union member's money. They must count votes of delegates from a local, they may not count votes of delegates from a local in trusteeship at a convention or election, unless the local's membership elected the delegates by secret ballot. We don't want unions ridding their international elections by imposing trusteeships and then electing the delegates of their choice to send to that convention. That's not what the act wants us to, or wants to happen. So they can only count the votes if the locals engaged in a, a um, secret ballot election for those delegates. <clears throat> Title four of the uh, LMRDA, officer elections, sets minimum requirements for officer elections that a labor union must follow, including the maximum amount of time between the elections. And really, it, does, it is minimum requirements. The, the act isn't you know, exhaustive in how every aspect of the union uh, election needs to be ran or won. But it does lay out some basic things, like it must be a secret ballot election. Now it must be secret. Um, it must, members, all eligible members must be allowed to vote. Um, all um, members, eligible members who want to be a candidate in the election have the right to, to nominate or be nominated <coughs> for a position. The, element, the officer elections, Title IV also requires that the union constitution and bylaws be followed. Now, the governing body of the act, <coughs> when we look at constitution and bylaws, if they're in conflict, the act prevails. But what we find is a lot of unions have election provisions in their international and local election constitution bylaws that comply fully with that. And we like to see that because then we know that the elections are being held there. It also establishes members' rights to be a candidate for office or vote the election subject to reasonable rules uniformly imposed. Um, I'm not going to go too deep in that detail but on that. Candidates have the right to union distribution of his or her campaign literature and to have election observers at phases of the election, every phase of the election, the mailing of the ballots, counting of the ballots. That it requires a 15-day mail notice of election be sent to the membership. That 15-day mail notice must be by postal mail, cannot be by email. Um, we're investigating a union right now. Their, nominate, their notice of election went out via email to all of their members. And I can tell you from the day I opened that case, we're going to be rerunning that case soon. And 
all because they thought it would be easier to use email. The act requires the notice of election be mailed 50 days prior to the election to the member's last known address. Requires that members vote a secret ballot and prohibits the use of union or employer funds to support a candidate. Who must be elected? Officers named in the Constitution must be elected? Yes, sir. Uh, when it says the union has to distribute the advice for a candidate, that's that the candidate. It definitely is. Union can impose a reasonable uh, rule that says that all candidates must pay X dollar amount to have their campaign literature distributed by the union. That's perfectly acceptable. As long as all candidates are treated uh, the same. and um, it's a reasonable rule. You know, what's reasonable really depends on the situation. So case by case, we look at those. But yes, you're right. Members of union executive boards or similar governing bodies must be elected. All who have policy making or executive authority, regardless of their title, um, must be elected. Conventions of delegates who elect officers uh, of an international or national at a, or intermediate, intermediate body must be elected. So um, everyone from the local union officials all the way up to international and national union officials. Locals must hold elections every three years, intermediates every four years, nationals or internationals every five years. A union may hold elections more very frequently than the act requires. We don't see that a lot. Any member in good standing who meets reasonable qualifications that are outlined in the union constitution and bylaws that are uniformly applied may run for office. Persons not barred from the office under section 504, that's where we talk about certain crimes that a union officer may have committed would bar them from office. Members may file a complaint um, uh, with OLMS. They must follow up an appeal procedures that are outlined in their constitution and bylaws before filing a complaint with us. So the intent of the act is to give unions the chance to remedy their own in-house elections. And if the union and, and member can't, you know, they, it can't be remedied or it's not remedied, the member has certain um, ways they can then come to us. A member may file within OMS within one calendar month after receiving a final decision under their constitution and bylaws concerning the election, or after waiting three calendar months from filing their initial protest with the union um, and not receiving a final decision if they've waited three calendar months, not received the final decision, then they have one calendar month to file with us at that point. Sure. Yes. So the slide back mm -hmm. talk about the intermediate union office. Yes. Would that be considered a district office of an international union? It would be. Yes. It would it would oftentimes be a district office or a council. Um, sometimes committees, depending on what their functions are. And, and so we have a program under the act. Um, where it's called an existence investigation, where we go out if we, if we get an, uh, <coughs> information saying so and so is, an, is a labor organization subject to the act of not filing, we'll go in and look at their organizational structure to make a determination whether they are subject or not. Because not every organization that a union forms is subject to that. Only those that actually you know, seek to negotiate collective bargaining agreements or other things. So we, we have those type of investigations to look at that structure. Okay, um, so as I said earlier, Secretary of Labor may file suit in federal district court to set aside an invalid election and request a new election to be held under OMS supervision. Oftentimes, instead of that route, we choose to go voluntary compliance. Let's work with the local union officers or whoever that election impact and say, can we somehow agree to you let us run this election for us? We have. And as long as we can sign off on a settlement agreement, we'll do that. Oftentimes, we sign off. Settlement agreements. Title V safeguards for labor organizations. Officers have a duty to manage the funds and property of the union solely for the benefit of the union in accordance with its constitution and bylaws. That's basically what the act says, section 501A. A union officer or employee who embezzles or otherwise misappropriate union funds or assessments commits a federal crime punishable by fine and or imprisonment. Imprisonment, that's section 501C. Officials who handle union funds or property must be bonded against losses, section 502. A union may not have outstanding loans to any officer or employee that in total exceed $2,000. So, um, the, you know, union funds are not a, a personal bank to be used by the union officials or employees. 
Um, persons convicted of certain crimes, Section 504, can be barred for a period of up to 13 years or are barred for a period of 13 years um, after conviction or after the end of their imprisonment. In Title VI, miscellaneous provisions. Um, this title grants the Secretary of Labor the authority to investigate possible violations of most provisions of the Act and in enter premises, examine records, and question persons in the course of the investigation. It's, it's pretty frequent we go up to a, sorry, do you have something? Okay. It's pretty frequent that we go to a union and, well, you don't have any jurisdiction to walk into my union. Well, Section Title VI says I do. And we'll print that out and give it to the union, and then if, if we, we're, you know, if there's not cooperation happening, we ultimately have subpoena authority where we can get what we need through that route. Don't like to use that route. It typically tends to be the most, you know, um, I like to work with you. Um, but this is the act that gives us all of the rights that we have. Yes? How often do you have I would say the majority of the time that we have resistance is for one of two reasons. One, there's some type of illegal activity happening in that union, and they're trying to cover it up, so they don't want us in there. So that's always a red light, like oh, something might be going on. Two, education. That union officer or employee has not been educated as to who we are and what we're supposed to do. They haven't received the compliance, they haven't come to one of our sessions and learned. So they, they want to start off fighting us right then, and we quickly you know, step up and show them our authority and pull out our nice little badges and, and Typically, we'll get compliant pretty quick. You know, a lot of times, it, it's one of those two reasons. I, I wouldn't say it's very frequent. Um, you know, we've been around since the 50s, late 50s. Um, in one form or another, most unions have heard of us. It tends to be, if it is um, resistance, it's a smaller union because they've just not had the chance to hear about us. Section 602 prevents extortionate picketing. Um, extortionate picketing is when picketing occurs on or about an employer's premises for the purposes of extracting payments other than wages or benefits from that employer. The act says that's illegal. So uh, we don't get very many of those um, in the South. Um, a union or any of its officials may not fine, suspend, expel, or otherwise discipline a member for exercise of his rights under the LMRDA, um, except in accordance with the Constitution bylaws um, provisions. So, but if a union member, do, or if a union does purposely punish, suspend, expel a member because they they seek to re, uh, to exercise one of their rights to the act, the member in a private sector um, union may, uh, is required to file suit and federal district court to enforce that provision. Oh, I messed up. Under the provisions of 610, no one may use, uh, use or threaten to use force or violence to interfere with a union member's right in the exercise of a, his or her rights under the LMRDA. There's a scenario earlier where I said union official member get into it, union official makes some type of threat to bodily harm against that member for exercise of his rights. It's a federal crime. We don't want you to step over those lines. Sure. Yes. They could the it, it it threats or act of violence against. So it could be, you know, I'm gonna slash your tires. I investigated a case several years ago in Phoenix. It was exactly that. A union officer was threatened, I'm gonna slash your tires. Well the members' tires came up slashed three days later. You know, it was that that union um, um, officer retaliating against that member for their exercise of their rights. So it doesn't have to necessarily be physical bodily harm. But another, another uh, provision that they would use to intimidate a member would be the law of employment. So would that be covered? That would not be covered here. That would be covered under the previous section where we talked about. Um, a member is, is seeking to exercise his rights, the union is somehow punishing him by withholding employment, that would be set subject to privacy by the member. 
So 6-2 prohibits any person from depriving a union member of his or her rights. If it's a, a union thug, it's not affiliated with the union, which you don't see a lot of anymore here in the South. Um, or if it's a, a you know um, a mem uh, employer, anybody who, who tries to to prohibit that member from the exercise of his rights. We investigate the allegations of 610. All right, I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, yes. Uh, I wonder if you received reports for how to conduct elections in the American Council of the Courts. I, uh, we have not. I don't recognize the um, So, is there a jurisdictional boundary between the professional associations and the labor unions and so not look at professional associations? Some kind of organization of employees that span boundaries between workers and possibly some kind of labor and NLRP. I can't speak to the specifics of uh, like the organization you brought up. I can say that you know, it's not a recognized labor organization. I can say that because it's not a disclosure. Um, what, I, what I can say is yes, our, our basics investigation program, we need to get um, information that shows that a new uh, sub organization may be subject to that. Or maybe engage in some type of employer employee relationship or employee union relationship, we will conduct the next investigation to look into this. Oftentimes, it's based on information from the public uh, or you know, how it's used by everybody else. So maybe you know, my understanding of how it's going on in certain organizations. So, yes, we do look into there are differences between certain fraternal organizations and labor unions. Um, but we would have the jurisdiction to go in and look and see what is the exact relationship between those two organizations. And if it's one that's subject to the act, we would you know, require them to file necessary reports and become what we call a labor organization. Do you get involved in jurisdictional disputes between unions? We try not to. We try to let unions work out their own internal problems. The, the, um, National Labor Relations Board. Um, oftentimes, people think that we OMS are, you know, we, we do those type of representational type of investigations. We don't. We are very, we, we, we're not those people. They're not us. We, um, so, oftentimes, um, when it comes to those type of disputes, it doesn't have anything to do with jurisdiction. We will look into to see if there is a jurisdictional element that we need to look at. Um, and if there is a uh, potential jurisdictional issue, we will, I think, resolve it. But oftentimes, we find that we don't have those type of uh, instances we don't have jurisdiction. Other questions? All right, so www.olms.dol.gov or simply www.dol.gov. You can find us through those websites. You can send information to OMS. Uh, that's public at dol.gov or mass shield dash public at dol.gov goes to my district office. Um, and then we have a labor call center, 1 4 USA DOL, where people in our national office can help you out. And that was it. Any questions? No? Thank you all so much for letting me come today. I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, like I said, I have to leave early today after this. But I will be back tomorrow if you have any questions or anything to anything. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Okay? Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh, and Cindy, thank you for um, your Twitter. All right. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're going to have a break now, uh, so you can all. Uh, uh, we have some um, uh, Danish and some uh, coffee and tea. Uh, but before you start doing that, tomorrow morning we have uh, Phil Laporte, 
uh, who's a National Academy arbitrator and an officer in that association, will be here uh, chairing a mock arbitration session. Um, and Phil is uh, unfortunately a Boston Red Sox fan, uh, but he's from Boston. Um, but he uh, has uh, produced a mock arbitration based upon a Major League Baseball case. And uh, we have uh, a three a three arbitrator panel, um, and we have the, we have those three participants, um, either uh, Peter Chang or uh, his colleague from Alabama, Mike Cunningham, who's coming, will be one of the arbitrators on the panel. Um, and, uh, and Phil Laporte will be, and then Brian Kennedy, who was here yesterday and is from uh, Athens State University, will be. Um, but we have five other uh, uh, actors uh, that I'm recruiting from uh, our participants at the conference. So if you would like to be uh, the Grievant, the Grievance Council. Um, maybe we can get some of our attorneys to do that. Um, the M uh, a witness for Major League Baseball or a union witness. Um, let me know. Excuse me. So, during the break, um, I'll be around and I'll be happy to uh, talk with you about what role you might play in this uh, in this uh, soon to be on Broadway play. So, all right, have a nice break. Uh, there's coffee, tea, Danish.